Okay, um, we are going to go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for okay. tuning in tonight. Um, uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, uh, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Um, and again, thank you as, uh, for joining us as we continue our special speaker series um, where in a few short moments, I will bring on our guest presenter tonight, uh, Gina Roxas, uh, to present tonight's program titled Healing Plants, Native American Connections to Nature for Health and Healing. Uh, before we get to tonight's program, did want to go over a few items, promote some upcoming events in the series, uh, let you know about other things happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and CCFPD. Uh, first, if you haven't done so already, um, let us know where you are watching from tonight uh, by writing in the comment section below where you're tuning in from this evening. Um, Amanda's tuning in from Bloomington. Thank you for being here. Uh, and Carrie is tuning in from Kendall County. Um, uh, so thank you all uh, for joining us. Let us know where you're watching from by jotting that down in the comment section below. Uh, tonight, uh, we're joined on screen uh, by Janny. Uh, Janny will be assisting us this evening uh, with American Sign Language Interpretation. So thank you so much to Janny for being here. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, if you don't know anything about the Museum of the Grand Prairie, um, our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Uh, we, we originally opened in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and we're a part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, which is a collection of seven forest preserves here in East Central Illinois, um, as well as two educational facilities, including our museum, the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, also um, uh, the Kickapoo Rail Trail, multi-purpose bike, walking, running, hiking trail, as as well as Lake of the Woods Golf Course and so much more here at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Um, in fulfillment of our district's mission to protect Champaign County's natural and cultural resources and inspire people to care for, enjoy, and explore their natural world, uh, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District recognizes its responsibility to acknowledge those Native peoples who came before us on this land. Uh, we currently work to preserve and tell the story of the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi Nations. Uh, Native Americans shape the landscape that the Forest Preserve District sits within. Uh, we must recognize that the Forest Preserves occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the peoples previously mentioned, and that they were the first stewards of the land. It's necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations, to work with them, and to continue to steward the land and educate the public with honor and respect. Uh, CCFPD will work to be inclusive of all differences and keep Native peoples and their history at the core of our efforts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this program is one of many programs in a special speaker series of virtual programs. Uh, this series began this summer um, when we opened up um, our, a new special exhibit at the Museum of the Grand Prairie in May uh, titled A History of Healing, Infectious Diseases and Community Responses to Defeat Them. Uh, the exhibit focuses on the local and worldwide impact of such diseases as the 1918 flu, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, polio, typhoid, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. In addition to examining the impact disease has had on our health and well-being, uh, the exhibit highlights particular instances in the past as well as the present where local citizens came together during previous epidemics and pandemics for the betterment of their communities. Uh, if you're local, we encourage everyone to come out and visit the special exhibit at our museum, or you know, you can always travel to come and see us. Uh, we're located in Muhammad, Illinois, and our current fall hours have the museum open every day from 1 to 5 p.m. And as always, admission to our museum is free. Also did want to let you know about a few other programs coming up soon in the series. On Thursday, October 27th at 7 p.m. Central Time, again on our museum and Facebook and YouTube pages like tonight's program, Dr. Lynn Curry, Professor Emerita of History at Eastern Illinois University, will present the program titled Kids and Germs, Child Health Reform in the Early 20th Century. So again, that program is on Thursday, 
October 27th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on our museum Facebook and YouTube pages. On Sunday, November 13th at 2 o'clock, we're trying something for the very first time. We're going to be hosting a hybrid program. So it will um, take place in person, live and in person at our museum at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, November 13th. And at the same time, we will work to stream that live in-person presentation taking place at our museum to our museum Facebook and YouTube pages so people can enjoy from wherever they may be or they can come to our museum and see the program in person. Um, uh, the program will be presented by Mike Mosley, curator of the Pearson Museum in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and he will present a program titled Medicine from the Past, a sampling of medicine from the Civil War era and Springfield area. Um, um, for updates and, and more info on all programs within this series, as well as what's happening throughout the Museum of the Grand Prairie and CCFPD, I uh, encourage you to find us on social media or visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Uh, should you have any questions or comments over the course of tonight's program, feel free to also put those down in the comment section below. Um, uh, lastly, uh, Special Speaker Series is sponsored in part by our friends at Illinois Humanities. I'd like to thank Illinois Humanities for supporting this virtual speaker series. Uh, we really enjoy working with such great organizations like Illinois Humanities and are very happy to work together to provide these virtual opportunities for our audience. Um, uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to bring on our guest presenter for tonight because you all didn't come to hear me speak uh, for the entire evening. Um, uh, so uh, bring it on Gina. Gina, hi, how are you doing? Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Gina Roxas. Um, I am a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. I also am the uh, program director at Trickster Cultural Center. We are a Native American owned, led and operated cultural center that centers Native American arts and culture um, as first voice in a contemporary way. So our focus is on Native American arts and Native American culture post 1960s or so, um, recognizing that um, Native Americans are still here practicing their traditions, practicing their culture, um, and learning, continuing to learn from the land that we are on. Um, so thank you very much, Gina. I really uh, appreciate you being here this evening. So, so with that, you know, I'll turn the rest of the show over to you. Um, and if you, if you'd like to share your screen, we can, we can get into the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Right. Woohoo, technology, huh? <laughs> All right. Take it oh, away, Judy. All righty. So um, today my presentation is Perspectives of the Land, Advocating Indigenous Traditions and the Garden Project at Trickster Art Gallery. We have undergone a name change. Uh, so we are now we are now called the Trickster Cultural Center. Um, so acknowledging the land, it was that was a wonderful um, that was a wonderful land acknowledgement that uh, was was had, and I just wanted to um, let folks know. I, I think land acknowledgements have been um, kind of trendy lately. Uh, it's started out in academia and other organizations, um, but I wanted to emphasize that land acknowledgements have been um, presented since time immemorial. Um, this goes to the um, Northwest uh, Pacific Coast, the um, Puyallup and, and other um, indigenous cultures there. They took canoe journeys and when they would travel from village to village in their trade routes before they even touched land or landed, they would acknowledge the people of that land and ask for permission to, to, um, to go onto the land um, and acknowledge all the gifts that that land had. And when I talk about land, I'm not just talking about the earth or the soil. Um, I, I, it's a generalized term. 
um, we're bound by English, so I have to use the word land. But I'm talking about that living um, entity, which is the air and the water and the land and the soil and the biomes and all of the um, life that is that makes up land. In the Potawatomi culture, in the Potawatomi language, 70% uh, of our words are verbs, 30% are nouns. So 70% of our words are action words, um, as opposed to the English language, which is reverse. 70% of the English language is nouns or objects. Um, we have, our language has life. Our language is centered on life and action. Um, everything um, that we encounter has life from the land and the rocks uh, and the animals and the plants. It, it's, it's all life that we are um, not just stewarding, but we are students of them, learning from them through close observation. Uh, what you're looking at right now is an image of Sky Woman. If any of you have read the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, she has a beautiful story regarding Sky Woman. And this is one of our origin stories um, in the Potawatomi culture and many um, Great Lakes cultures uh, regarding Sky Woman and how the land that we're on, which is called Turtle Island, was formed. Uh, so a little bit about home. Uh, home means many things to me. I grew up, uh, I was born and raised on the southeast side of Chicago. Um, Chicago is a word that's derived from the Potawatomi language, Chicago, which means wild leeks, land of the wild leeks. And so um, I shared a home with, in Chicago, as well as the uh, Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. My family um, still lives there on the reservation there out in Mayetta, Kansas. And how we got there was um, through forced removal from the area, from this area of the Great Lakes over to um, Mayetta, Kansas which is uh, what you're seeing here in this slide. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting facts and stories um, that you can find on the internet uh, and learn a little bit more about the history of, of this, tra what we call Trail of Death. Um, I know many of you know about the Trail of Tears, but there were many trails throughout the United States. Um, ours is not an uncommon story, unfortunately. There were many native cultures that had um, been forcibly removed, forced to walk from their homeland to another place. Uh, and so um, I'm a really big advocate for learning and working with indigenous cultures. Um, they're the ones who have undergone and, and worked through climate change, um, particularly the Potawatomi people. We're a Great Lakes tribe. Uh, we started, we, we settled and we were in the Great Lakes for, for many, many, many years. We lived off the lake. We lived off the lush forests, forests of the area. And when we were removed, we were removed and located to Mayetta, Kansas, which is a much different climate. So talk about climate change. Um, Kansas, there's, there's not much water there. Um, not at least large bodies of water. And it's very um, hilly, mid Midwestern type land. And so learning how to um, live in that land, uh, again, by observation and um, learning from the people that were already there, how to live there. And again, form formulating a plan uh, to thrive. And so um, here's some contemporary pictures. This is my family out on the reservation. This is the land that we own um, and we are still stewarding the land. Um, you're seeing some pictures of um, the farmland that we have and my family there um, working on that land. Um, this was around uh, the fallish time when, when things were getting, were getting ready for the cold weather and winter. And so we're still here. We're still um, incorporating our traditions, incorporating our, our, our culture 
in, in everyday life. And so um, this next slide, I call it a historical timeline. For, and it's a historical timeline of my family. What you're seeing here are five living generations of my family that continue to maintain relationships to the land. Um, you have the black and white photo, which is my grandmother and my father and uncle who are on the um, Prairie Band Potawatomi Reservation on, in one of the community gardens. Um, all the way from myself as a young child fishing with my father and my children gardening, as well as my grandchildren even in the garden. Um, we have had such a close relationship to gardening and uh, working with the land in relationship with the land. Um, I can go back for five gen living generations and this is what we do. And now we go to um, what, what I do now for, for work, I guess, for a paycheck. Um, it's, called the, it's called Trickster Cultural Center. Uh, and we have what's called the Trickster Garden Project. So Trickster Cultural Center is located in Schaumburg, Illinois, which is a northwest suburb of Chicago. So we're, we are still in an urban area. And in Illinois, um, there are no reserve lands, there are no reservations, and so there isn't a place for folks like me to continue my culture, continue my tradition of healing with plants um, through foraging. And so um, what we have done is we have this garden, which we're, we call the Garden Project. It's a living, it's a living entity, it's, it, it will never be complete. And what we're doing is we're stewarding this little section of the land in Schaumburg with native plants of Illinois that have cultural connections to uh, Native American tribes, not just the Potawatomi, but um, because we are in an urban setting, we have many cultures that pass through and settle uh, in our area. And so we learn by our elders well, through storytelling and seed sharing and, and observing these plants and it's very interesting. Um, I've learned so much throughout the years with this garden project, not just um, from the folks that pass through and tell their stories of how they use these plants for healing, but just by observing the garden and watching the garden grow and how it changes through the seasons. Um, it's, it's just very, to me, very interesting. And how um, this little garden, this little piece of land can bring forth so much healing. Um, I, I think it's um, it's important to work with nature, to be connected to nature. Um, that is a, a really um, integral part of healing um, ourselves. Even if you don't know how to garden or you don't or are not confident in gardening, just the act of walking in nature um, just changes your mood. Uh, I don't know anyone who can be sad uh, and looking at one of these beautiful sunflowers or some of these other beautiful plants that are around. Um, and it's wonderful to have this type of garden as a community, um, a community space. We see so many folks from so many different walks of life with lots of stories. Um, a garden and gardening can be a wonderful platform to talk out issues and projects and, and programs um, to have heavy conversations to heal each other. Uh, you know, just by sitting in the garden, um, tending to the plants, watering the plants, conversations just um, organically pop up and we're able to talk things through maybe in a setting of this where we would not be able to do that maybe indoors or in an office or at a meeting space. But within a garden, it just seems like people are more open and um, open to hearing as well as open to sharing their feelings and their thoughts. And so this is really, a, I, I love this project. I've been working on this project for about four years now. And I learn something new every season. And even throughout the different seasons, looking at the garden, um, watching the different colors 
and the different species of life that walk through and pass through or make the garden their home. It's just a wonderful observation. Uh, we also have a collaboration with the, with Oakton Community College and their community garden. This is where we're growing um, we're growing traditional food crops in in um, in a garden setting. Uh, this is uh, more about food. However, um, for me and for many Native folks, uh, food is healing. Food is health. Food is healing. Uh, Many of you probably have felt ill and maybe mom or grandma gave you a nice warm bowl of chicken soup or some other type of soup. And it just made you feel much better. That, um, that's healing. It's not a medicine, it's not a pill that you took, but it's the care and the love um, and the healing that that person prepared for you. They prepared a medicine for you. And so I always feel strongly that food is healing. Uh, food is medicine. We grow traditional, um, mostly Potawatomi plants, traditional Potawatomi plants, um, some traditional corn crops and um, squash and ceremonial watermelon, as well as uh, a few varieties of beans. Uh, and this is a great place for learning. Uh, we have folks from the college who come out and help us uh, with the garden and we work with um, with different learning different growing techniques uh, intertwining traditional knowledge as well as um, uh, scientific stem knowledge and so even uh, this season we will start growing um, this will be our first year growing in the fall winter season we're growing um, some cold crops with a hoop house that we'll be installing um, so again, this is another exciting project that I love to do. And these things are things that anyone can do. Um, you can grow a garden in your in your backyard or in your home or find a community garden and find some of these wonderful plants. Um, maybe some of the foods that you traditionally eat can grow and incorporate those in your diet. And so um, I talked a lot about garden and gardening, um, but what, what's key is that transfer of knowledge. So when I work with gardens, I work with programs, um, I work with other organizations, my stance and my, my goal is to have it intergenerational. Um, in our programming, our programming is always open to all. In many other organizations, um, park districts, schools, um, folks are segregated by age level or expertise. Um, in a traditional setting, everyone is invited. Everyone is incorporated into the tasks at hand um, with, the, with the intent that the elders are the ones with the knowledge will transfer that knowledge to the younger or inexperienced ones who then carry that knowledge and, and are able to learn, learn by experience, not through a book, not through Googling, but actually getting your hands dirty um, and working on, on working with these plants. <clears throat> For me, knowledge um, is a living entity. We are simply placeholders for the knowledge. As humans, we have such a short lifespan compared to a mountain or a tree that we can't hold knowledge. We shouldn't hold knowledge to ourselves. We should let knowledge flow through us to the next generation. Uh, and so with a lot of the things that we do, we work with young folks, we work with um, our elders and maintaining that bridge so that we can transfer our knowledge, our traditional stories, our ceremonies, our culture, our language to our younger generation to keep that knowledge alive. And so how do we do that? A lot of it is with traditional oral teachings, traditional stories. What I have here for you is um, 
and an Ojibwe star map, as well as a, a, a winter uh, oak tree or oak tree in the winter time. Um, many of our stories have these teachings, have these um, morals or, or um, directives of how to live and how to live in harmony with nature. And so um, many of our stories are not written. You'll, you'll find very few that are written. A lot of our traditional knowledge is passed on through oral teachings or storytelling. Um, for me, uh, learning about the plants, learning plant knowledge, it's a lifelong journey for me. And I will work with elders and mentors, and I may ask them, um, one in particular that I'm thinking of, um, I'll travel back to Kansas and talk with, with my mentor and ask about a particular plant and ask my mentor, what, what can you tell me about this plant, whatever plant it is that I, I'm thinking about? And they'll tell me a story. And that story may not even mention the plant. And I'll go back home and think about it and, and kind of work through that. And then I might go back another time, a second time. And I'll get another story. Maybe it's about that plan I asked. Maybe it's not. I may have to do that three or four times before I, it finally clicks and I get the gist of what my mentor was saying. It all makes sense then. Uh, and that's how traditional oral teachings usually are. Um, these stories that you hear um, through storytellers, through mentors, you get a message and it may not be the message that you were seeking, but it's the message that you should be receiving at that moment. There's a state, there's a saying, um, Indian time, and it's, it's got a kind of a bad connotation. Um, it might, um, reflect that uh, Native Americans are late to everything. But that's not really where it came from. Indian time, it actually is a good thing. Indian time means y you, you get what you get when it's the time that you need to get it. You're at a place and you're present at a place when it's the time you should be present. Things will happen in the time that they should happen. And that's really what Indian time means. And so that going back and forth to my mentor, it may feel and seem frustrating at first, um, but that's really, I'm getting what I'm supposed to be getting at the time. Uh, in Western and even to, and in today's society, we're so rushed with technology and internet, Google, we have you know information at our fingertips instantaneously. And we're so accustomed to that, that it's really, um, it's, kind of, it's refreshing to have to slow down and ruminate on what's being spoken to us and listen very intently on the stories, on the teachings that we're receiving. And so uh, you all came here to learn about medicinal plants. And so I gave you a little bit of background uh, and so I'm going to start off with uh, medicinal plants as food. So working together, we have a story called the Three Sisters, where um, three plants, three sister plants, had worked together harmoniously or symbiotically uh, to, to live a good life. And so when I grow my uh, food crops, I grow in a three sister style, um, as you can see in these photos. Uh, the plants are planted in mounds, so we don't even till the we don't till the soil. We mound the soil and we plant. We plant our sister corn first, which is the oldest sister. Once sister corn is is up a couple inches, then we'll plant around sister corn. We'll plant sister bean. Once sister bean has been established, we'll plant our youngest sister, Sister Squash. And this may seem a little chaotic, a little tangled, 
at first, but it really is a, a really wonderful system uh, of growing. You get the corn um, and the sturdy stalk to be able to hold the bean, the bean vines, um, the beans then wrap around that corn and grow vertically. And their root system is able to take uh, atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into nitrogen that plants can use for food. And then you have the younger sister, sister squash there on the bottom, which acts as a living mulch to maintain the moisture, um, keep the keep the insects and critters away. And um, and it, it, it's a symbiotic relationship. There's been studies even on this and how the root systems work together to make sure that not one sister is getting all the nutrients or getting all the water. It's a very um, symbiotic relationship. Also, when you're harvesting them and when you're preparing these, these foods, eating corn, bean, and squash together in a dish, like a three-sister salad or a three-sister soup, you're getting the carbohydrates and a little bit of protein from the corn. And then you're getting those that rich um, protein from all of the beans. And you get some vitamins from the and, and minerals from the squash. And, may, it, and together, that's a complete food uh, that you can, you can sustain yourself um, off of. Um, this, this is wonderful, um, wonderful, healthy food that you can eat that helps you um, grow helps you maintain cell cell growth and is really good for you. Uh, there's no need to add any other extra protein. It is you know just as a wonderful food group. And there's so many ways to prepare this. Um, like I said, there's a salad, there's soups, there's hot dishes, there's cold dishes, uh, and even the type of plants that you're planting. You can plant a different variety of corn or a different type of bean or different, even different types of squash or even instead of squash, uh, plant pumpkin. And so we grow these three sisters every year in our garden at Oakton um, and use that food um, as a tradition and use it to prepare a traditional meal. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about corn. Corn has been with us for thousands of years. It started out as a grass. Corn started out as a grass, as you can see here, and through careful observation and uh, working with this plant and developing a relationship, we, we get today what, what looks like corn here. Um, for many Native American cultures, corn um, is a staple in their diet. Um, Corn grows, I believe, in every part of the world. There's even a variety in Antarctica. Uh, and we find corn in everything, um, from our biofuels to our foods. Some of our traditional corns, they look a lot different than what um, you might see at the grocery store. Um, what we have in Kansas, are, are for the Potawatomi, there's a white corn that's used as a cornmeal. And we have a red uh, dent corn that we use as um, sometimes it's feed, um, but that can also be used. Um, and these traditional corns that you might be able to find, they have a much different um, taste and texture. Um, and each corn is different and they look so beautiful. There's so many different varieties. I encourage you all to try to find different varieties of corn beyond what you can find in the supermarket. Uh, some of those you can find at farmer's markets or um, if you're close to a traditional uh, reservation or, or uh, settlement, then you might be able to um, find those also. Uh, and then we talk, I want to talk a little bit about um, cattails. So cattails you can find everywhere. There's basically water. Um, this is called uh, in a lot of ecological settings and forest preserve settings, cattails are called um, a survival food. And what that means is that this cattail can be used for food, for fuel, for clothing, for shelter. 
uh, what I what you see here is um, an image of a wigwam. Uh, that is the dwelling of the Great Lakes area. And so um, there was a survey that was given um, by the Smithsonian Institute oh, years back. And they asked folks, what do you know about Native Americans? And the number one answer was that Native Americans live in teepees. That is somewhat true. Not all Native Americans lived in teepees. In the Great Lakes region, you'll find folks lived in wigwams. And wigwam was a more permanent setting, permanent dwelling. On what you find uh, with a wigwam is that we were using, we are using wigwams with um, the natural resources that we found in the area of the Great Lakes. And so the frames were made out of willow, willow twigs. Willow is a very soft wood and can be easily bent. And so that frame would be tied together. Um, those willow branches would be tied together to create a frame. And then it would be lined with birch bark, the, the bark of a birch tree, white birch usually. Uh, and that, um, <clears throat> it looks a little rudimentary, maybe a little primitive to you all. However, there was a lot of engineering and architecture that went along with it. Uh, this dwelling can withstand the weight of, of large amounts of snow and rain. Um, if you think about the Great Lakes area, um, even in where you're at, it gets really cold in the winter. It gets very warm in the summer. So this, this dwelling had to be um, protected from the elements. And so what would happen is that the uh, leaves from the cattail would be gathered. And as you can see, these leaves are not flat. They're, they have a little bit of an indentation. They're almost like a V shape. And so when you put two leaves together, they form this air pocket. And when you start putting more and more leaves together and maybe weaving it into a mat, you get this, this honeycomb effect with little air pockets that you can line the inside of your wigwam and maybe the flooring. And that's a natural insulation. This is all sustainable. This is all um, natural material. So at the end of um, the life of this wigwam, it would be um, set on fire and returned to the earth. All of this, um, these materials, they weren't just used as um, material that you would use for a house today. They weren't just, you know, you go to the hardware store and you buy a package of nails and some wood. These all have medicinal qualities, medicinal connections to our culture. The birch, the willow, and the cattail. There's all medicinal qualities. So you're living surrounded by medicine. Um, so this is a, uh, this, this slide is a little, um, bit of my take on, or my response to the campaigns for everyone to plant milkweed. Um, and so there's all of these campaigns about let's plant more milkweed for the monarchs. Um, people walk around with t-shirts and signages that say plant more milkweed for the monarchs, save the monarchs. Um, I encourage you to plant milkweed for the monarchs, but also for yourself. Um, milkweed is actually a really um, good plant to have around. The, um, the, uh, the new leaves or the um, new shoots of the milkweed can be used and um, if done right, if done correctly, can be a really delicious soup with lots of medicinal qualities. Um, I don't encourage you all to go out right now and forage milkweed unless you know what you're doing. Um, but there is a really wonderful um, recipe for a milkweed soup. If you know anyone who makes milkweed soup, ask them for some. It's really good. Um, and the um, if you break a leaf off, so the, the 
the reason why it's called milkweed is if you tear a leaf or a stem, there's this white substance that comes out of the leaves. That white substance you can put on a bug bite or on um, a poison ivy rash, and that'll help heal that, um, that irritation to your skin. And so there's always this, you know, campaign about planting milkweeds for the monarch butterflies. And I think it's because, and this is my own personal um, observation, I think it's because monarchs are so um, what you would consider pretty and milkweeds have that beautiful flower bloom. But I encourage folks to look at rattlesnake master and the rattlesnake master borer. It's the same type of relationship that milkweed and monarchs have. Milkweed can't, or I'm sorry, the monarchs can't live without milkweed and the milkweed um, sustain the monarchs. It's the same relationship that a rattlesnake master and the rattlesnake master borer moth have. Although it's a lot harder to say, um, rattlesnake master borer moth, that's a, that's a mouthful. Um, and they're not as pretty. So I don't see anyone walking around with t-shirts saying plant more rattlesnake master for the rattlesnake master borer moth. Um, but I do encourage you, I encourage you to look this up and, and look at the, the relationship between these two. And, and this borer moth is actually considered, a, I believe still considered an endangered species. And so um, again, a take on what our perspectives are, what, what entices us to advocate, who, who gets advocated for, who gets lifted up. And I'm hoping that um, I encourage folks to learn a little bit more about nature, learn a little bit more about the plants that are in your area and how you all can help um, steward and learn from them. Uh, and then I just wanted to say thank you um, again for having me. I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for questions and answers. Um, or if I needed to cover any additional um, topics or additional things. I always like to keep it open for folks who may not have encountered or interacted with Native American folks in the past. This is the time to ask any question that you may have had about Native American um, traditions, Native American language, Native American uh, culture. I, I can, I'll, I'm here to, to answer. Um, no question is a silly question. And I just wanted to leave um, one last comment for you all. Uh, with, the, with climate change, we see a loss of biodiversity. We see a loss of uh, species. We see a lot of um, detrimental things happening to the land. Um, it's, it affects many native cultures and impacts them even more than that. With our culture, which is so tied to nature, it affects our traditions, it affects our language. Um, climate change has had a detrimental impact even today. Um, this year was the worst wild rice harvest in history. And it was because of climate change. Um, the lakes are, are warmer, um, biodiversity is lower, and so our harvest, our crops and our harvests are struggling. Um, with that loss of wild rice, or what we call, um, call it as monomen, um, we're not just losing a food substance, we're losing our medicine. Um, this is tied to our origin story. Our story is um, that we came from the East Coast and through directives from our elders, we're told to move west to where the food grows on the water. And that place is the Great Lakes area. And so I can't hand that story down and that teaching down to the next generation if there are no more, if there is no more wild rice. Um, and that goes for so much other um, traditional knowledge that we have as well. Um, for me as a grower, and as a forager, I le learn and I've learned through um, observation of the land, 
how and when to grow, how and when to forage, what to, what to forage, um, and when. Not by a calendar, not by Googling, um, but by the observations of the land. And so my teaching was that um, we tap the maple trees in the winter time or in the springtime, we tap the maple trees when we hear the woodpeckers. We stop tapping the maple trees when we hear the chorus frogs. We start planting our garden when we hear the thunders, the thunder beans that come to wake up Mother Earth, those spring rains. Within the last few years, it's been harder and harder to grow by that tradition, especially with um, the recent developments of climate change. The last few years I've been growing based off my tradition, based off my culture, and I'll grow a crop and after the thunders have come, but those spring rains are coming earlier and earlier. And then once my crop is established, we get hit with another snowfall and everything is ruined. That's not how it used to be. Even I would say five, 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. Um, this past winter, we were able to harvest um, maple sap for two days only before the thunders came. Once the thunders come, harvest time is over and it's time for planting. We weren't able to harvest, we weren't able to forage as much as, as we usually do. And so um, we're losing culture, we're losing our language. And um, I just wanted to leave that with you all. Um, for those of you who are working on conservation or climate change issues, um, I, I thank you. Uh, this impacts us quite a bit. It, it is detrimental that we all work together in collaboration to be able to thrive and continue living the good life. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And, you know, especially, you know, there at the end and, and speaking on climate change and um, <clears throat> effects that, you know, um, maybe not everybody is, is fully considering, you know, the, the effects is, you know, just touching every single part of life, um, you know, on the planet here. Um, so thank you for that. And then also, I, I just want to thank you too, Gina. You know, you said that, you know, gardening and food is healing and emphasize slowing down and listening. And just me personally listening to you talk and speak about uh, gardening and, 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 and the planet and, and your relationship you know, with them over the last 30 minutes was healing for me. Um, and kind of, I can just feel myself just internally slowing down a little bit and it's been kind of a stressful time. So I, I appreciate that. Um, so, um, so with that, you know, uh, uh, Gina mentioned, you know, she'd be happy to answer any questions. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comment section down below. Um, I have some questions coming in already. Um, uh, Marina, I know Marina, uh, we know Marina. Um, Hopefully you're still tuning in. Marina asked Gina, um, where do you get your seeds? Do you have a native seed bank by chance? We don't have a native seed bank. That's one of my um, goals to have. What I do is I share seeds with um, fellow growers um, and, and through the um, garden that we're working on, we collect the seeds and we haven't been able to be, to share seeds just yet, but that, again, that's one of our goals to be able to start um, uh, sharing it on a larger scale. Marina is actually, um, she's our museum's garden program specialist, um, one of our education staff and does a phenomenal job in, in getting uh, folks of all ages interacting with gardening and, 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 the, and the land and a very knowledgeable individual. Um, and she also, she, she added, she will take all that you have said and share it with others um, in her garden programs. Um, so wanted to add that as well. So thank you, Gina, for that. 
Um, before I forget, I, I had a video that I wanted to show. Um, it kind of, oh, sure. I, I forgot about that. Sorry. I, I wanted to show um, how um, I talked about our language and how language is um, verb based as opposed to noun based. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again. Sure. Um, are you able to see that? Yes. Yes, we are. So this is um, my brother. He um, he grows mushrooms. And in the Potawatomi language, there's a, a word for mushroom. And the, the English translation is that which pops with, up within the earth. So it's an action word. It's not a, a descriptive word of mushroom, but it's an action word. And he, he did a time lapse video. Um, which actually shows what that word is talking about. So I'll just play it. So this is a time lapse of um, mushrooms growing within 24 hours. It's a 24 hour um, oh, wow. time span. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he, he um, let me unshare my screen. So I thought that really epitomized that that word or the the whole language about language being action based and and as opposed to object based. Yeah, I, I really that that really made me think when you said that at the beginning of the presentation, you know, 70 percent action, 30 percent nouns. And then for the English language, it's it's vice versa. And, and you know, the power in language, you know, can and it kind of can tell you a lot, you know, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, about about each culture there. So that's that really made me think. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, Gardner asked this question. Uh, what would you suggest? From your perspective as as top three native plants to bring into a city garden i mean um any thoughts there gina sure um <clears throat> so i would say um if you have the space hawthorns uh, hawthorn berries are, are are really a great healing plant the berries are known to help with heart health and high blood pressure uh, those are that's a really great um, if you're looking for healing plants um, another one would be um, sage prairie sage uh, we use that a lot for um, cleansing and smudging um, even if you're not native american you can still incorporate that either in your diet or um, just have it around your house to help. Um, what it does is it helps with um, balancing those energies, negative energies. There's even been studies uh, where it was shown that the act of smudging or lighting that sage on fire balances out negative, um, negative elements within the atmosphere. And so there is that, that whole balance um, quality in prairie sage. Plus, it's a beautiful smelling plant. Um, and then the third one I would say would be to grow um, echinacea. Those are really great um, pollinator plants, as well as uh, really good medicinal qualities. You could, the, the flowers uh, and the roots can be used as a tea to help with, um, with uh, sickness, with cold, the common cold and allergies. Um, I've been told that the seeds, after they're dried, if you bite into it, it has like a Novocaine effect, a numbing effect. So you can use that for a toothache. Um, if you do try some of these medicinal plants, I highly recommend that you talk with somebody who is an expert on these. Um, don't just go in and pick plants and start eating them. That's probably not a good idea. Um, one of the stereotypes um, that we encounter is that folks think that Native Americans just walked around um, 
the forest and started eating plants. And, and that's how they figured out which ones were medicine and which ones were not. If that was the case, we probably wouldn't even be here. <laughs> um, most of the plants um, are okay to have. Um, some of them can actually kill you and many of them can make you very, very sick. Um, it's by close observation. And what we observed, we observed nature, we observed um, in this area, in the Great Lakes area, we probably observed the bison. Um, I've been told we, we watched bison and saw what they ate. Uh, and because we're such close in a species as they are, we followed them. They were our teachers on what to eat or not to eat. Thank you for that, Gina. Um, uh, Carrie is asking, um, do you have any favorite resources books, other materials, other outlets for learning about plant medicine from the perspective of native cultures, particularly people of the Great Lakes region? A good, a good starter book would be um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It's not a resource book. Um, it's a book of stories. Um, there is some uh, plant knowledge. There's a lot of plant knowledge, but it's more story based. Um, that's really a good um, first start, a good starter book. Um, there's another book called Plants Have So Much to Teach Us um, by Mary Junius. Um, she's an Ojibwe writer who accounts for her, um, her mother's teachings. And her mother was an ethnobotanist and a teacher, I believe, at University of um, Michigan or Wisconsin. And those are two really good books. How I learned is I, I just I asked a lot of questions, went to gardens, went to nature places and asked questions, um, went to my elders and asked for any knowledge that they would give me. Um, I also went to school. Uh, my my, um, I guess my major, I guess is what you would call it, is environmental science, uh, particularly ethnobotany. And a lot of times, um, if you're going from an academic perspective, uh, plant guides, field guides are really great. Not the telephone plant apps, those are okay, but a plant guide, like an actual book <laughs> with pages that have pictures and, and some of the different um, identifiers. That's a real, those are really good foundational tools to start learning about plants. Um, but just being in nature, that's the way you should learn. It's just going somewhere and learning. I like that. Thank you. Um, Amanda asks, can you explain some past and current truths behind the role of the medicine man? It, sure. That question. Yeah. So, um, a true medicine man is not going to call himself a medicine man or a medicine woman. Um, a medicine man is what people call them. Um, they don't call themselves that. And that's just really someone who is an expert in maybe plant knowledge, um, medicinal plant knowledge, or other type of ceremony or tradition. It's a they're a knowledge keeper. Okay. Um, maybe one last question. This one is from me. Um, you know, I, I really like the slide that you showed at the beginning with the five circles and you talked about five living generations and, um, you know, and interacting with the land and, and, and so on. Um, do you have any, in, personally, any particular memories that stick out for you personally, when it comes to interacting with the land, whether it's, you know, interacting, as you mentioned, with your elders or your children or your grandchildren, and does, is there, is there one that sticks out to you or uh, a handful or anything that you'd like to share maybe to end us this evening? Sure. There's so many. I, I um, the one in particular is probably the first, my first interaction or one of my first interactions with plants and healing plants. Um, I was about three or four years old and I was very sick in the hospital. I, I think I had pneumonia hmm. and um, I wasn't doing, I wasn't a good patient. Um, I cried for my mom and dad. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't cooperate. I wouldn't take my medicine. 
And so the doctors and nurses were very frustrated with me and told my mom that they just, they didn't know what else to do. They, whatever they did just made me worse. And so my father, he came one day to visit and they told him that same story. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. And he walked over to my little hospital crib, wrapped me up in a blanket, took all the little um, things off of my arms and, and the oxygen off all those monitors and walked right out of the hospital and walked me out of the hospital. And he walked straight to my great grandmother, his grandmother's house and left me with her. And she healed me with her. She, she was a medicine keeper, a knowledge keeper. She healed me with her traditions and her knowledge, her medicinal knowledge. And we, we lived next to her. And so I stayed with her for a little bit until I, I felt better. And um, I just remember early memories after that, watching her and helping her in her garden, helping her tie bundles of plants to dry and helping her plants and helping her tend the garden out here in Chicago. Um, so I, I, I kind of owe my life to plants. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. It's a very personal story. It's a great story. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to end, I think. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Gina, uh, for welcome. joining us tonight, uh, presenting, providing your perspective. And again, this has been this has been so great, you know, just, you know, I, selfishly for me personally, this I, I feel I feel good. Um, so so thank you. Um, thank you to everybody tuning in. Um, getting some thank yous coming in from folks um, as well. Amanda says, thank you. Um, a, a gardener says, thank you. Um, Carrie says, thank you for sharing with us. You know, I echo that as well. Um, thank you to, uh, to Janny uh, for joining us tonight as well uh, in providing ASL interpretation, trying to make our programs, uh, our virtual programs a little bit more accessible. So thank you so much, Janny. Um, and hope to see you all. Uh, at uh, other programs within the series or visit the Museum of the Grand Prairie soon. Um, so with that, I hope everybody enjoys their evening. Um, and until next time, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>